I'm here with Greg, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his dairy farm here. Hi, welcome to Who Close Leads. Uh, Greg here with uh, a bit of an intro on uh, how many cows we're milking. Uh, 280 at the moment, and uh, we milk them robotically with six Gia monoboxes, and we enjoy the fruits of sand bedding. Between the two, we get uh, very low somatic cell counts. Um, Mastitis is not so much of a challenge like it used to be. A little bit about our farm history. We're second generation. Uh, parents immigrated from uh, the Netherlands. We uh, enjoy all the, uh, the hard work that my dad did in uh, laying the foundation and the building blocks for uh, us to uh, enjoy some of the hard work that uh, he, he laid for us and kind of blazed the trail. and. Uh, my dad was one that was never afraid of uh, new ideas or new technology and uh, so that's kind of been passed on to the second generation and uh, yeah, we're enjoying uh, the journey of learning robotic milking that we uh, began five years ago and as Vince likes to say, we're living the dream. So I'm standing on a balcony they have here just off of their coffee room and they got a couple chairs here and they can just see the entire freestyle barn here it's it's pretty awesome and right below us is where the robots actually are I'm uh, Vince at Hoop Holsteins, and welcome to our robot room, single room, six gear mono boxes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's all inliner everything, uh, auto attachment through a camera, and it does inliner cleaning and post dipping, as well as stimulating and all the rest of it. So I guess it's easiest just to watch it and we'll talk about it as we go. She wants to get in there. <laughs> so here we got a cow entering to be milk. And of course, she gets identified. She has a milking permission. The arm is coming out to catch. Once the cow is attached, it sprays warm water on the uh, teats in liner to clean everything. And we can tell by the color scheme here what's going on as you see the colors change. So it's washed and now it's stimulating the teat. And once they turn a dark blue, then we'll have milk flow, dete or milk flow detection. The previous to that, it is decided on the couple milliliters of milk that is pulled out and ran through the color checks, uh, somatic cell checks, all the rest of it, and it'll decide what it wants to do with the milk per quarter. So that's pretty cool. So before it starts putting the milk to the bulk tank, it's gonna test each one and say if it's good or not and make a decision to put it in your milk tank. That's correct, yeah. Are you guys feeding grain in the robots right now? Or? We're feeding grain in the robots. Uh, we're averaging about three and a half kilos of cow per day. Uh, we're doing our best all the time to bring that number lower and lower and do more or a better job, I guess, in the PMR and get her the groceries out there and not get it at the robots. Because it's more expensive at the robots? It's more expensive at the robots. And what we're finding is that we have more consistent milk production the less grain we put in here because oh, really? the cow is eating more 
and it just seems to be that the cow is healthier number one number two she's not going through those peaks and valleys of getting too much of the robot of grain and then she goes and lay down she leaves here she's going to the bunk because she wants everything right on yeah. I've it's, never it's, heard that before, but it makes fire, sense. It's a balancing act on how much to put there for nutrition, but we all have this misconception. I believe it's a misconception that the more grain you put in the robot, the more visits you're going to get. I don't think that's necessarily correct. I think milk production drives visits, and how are you going to get that milk production in the oven? Well, it's through the bunk, it's not through the grain in the robot. But that's just me. Nothing really earth shattering here. Perimeter, perimeter fed barn with approximately 300 salts. Uh, sand bedding. We do do sand recovery through a sand lane. We're just working on uh, putting in a sand cannon just to get a little bit drier sand in the winter time in our rainy climate. First and second lactation on one side of the barn with access to three robots. And everybody else is on the mature side of the barn with access to three robots. Uh, simple cow flow, it's kind of a hybrid design of, uh, it's not free flow, it's not control flow, but we are controlling the exit out of the commitment pen, which allows us to segregate our fresh cows to a separate area, or our breeding cows or cows that are in heat, they can be uh, controlled on the exit. To a separate pen and then you get general population so it's kind of a hybrid seems to work pretty good for us here we have the uh, our calf barn and I think when we talk about calves lots of research has been put into uh, the colostrum and the quality of the colostrum when the calf is born and we emphasize that checkpoint uh, we measure test our colostrum if it doesn't meet uh, the requirements of 25 on the bricks we're supplementing it with a dried colostrum ideally within two hours that calf has its colostrum after they spent 48 hours where we're harvesting the fresh colostrum from the dam then they come into the calf barn here uh, they come in here and they then transition to a uh, milk replacer and we've chosen milk replacer because we had a journey with staph mastitis and that was one of the strategies to eliminate the staph and uh, currently the consistency that milk replacer provides far outweighs the risk of raw milk, pasteurizing, etc, etc. We have recently adopted um, Alta's first milk program and that's where we take the dried colostrum each calf gets an additional 35 grams of dried colostrum for four, the first 14 days of life and we have seen great result, results in uh, setting up uh, reduced risk of uh, scours and we on our farm there's definitely a relationship with scours to the incidence of pneumonia so if we can you know, the whole team is working on reducing any risk to the calves of, of eventually coming down with the pneumonia. Uh, I'm not a big fan of genomics because I still believe that until I eliminate all the health events in a calf's uh, life, that probably trumps uh, the information that genomics will give me. So that's kind of the little bit of what we do here with our calf care. and I. Uh, We'll also say that we have some uh, great staff that really pay attention to detail and are always look to take it to the next level in, in calf care. Awesome. This is the entry point of our calves life cycle after they've been weaned off milk. They're on solids now and 
we start with uh, this first pen here. They're about three months of age now, and they just uh, graduate as they grow, and we do it mostly by by size and age, and they just, uh, there's an additional one, two, three, four, four more pens, and by the end of the row here, they are confirmed pregnant. We'd like to have them bred first time, 13, 14 months, and uh, hopefully confirmed pregnant by 14 months, and then we slide them over to the other side of the barn on your left here, and that's where the pregnant animals are. And then the last two sections on the barn here, we have our dry cows, our far off dry cows. And over here we have our close up pen. In a perfect world, we'd probably have another additional 100 feet on the new barn to house our dry cows and close up so we don't have to move them from barn to barn. Less stress, better you know, results in the calving pen, but we all live within budget restraints. So this is the way we've got it set up. Awesome, this is a pretty cool barn. So we're behind the dairy barn now and we're looking at some equipment. So you guys do all your own field work pretty much? We do all our own field work except for corn planting. That's just something that we've not gotten into because it's usually waiting for the rain. So put it on somebody else's shoulders. Uh, but everything else we do do on our own. We run a fleet of fen tractors. We've just uh, grown to like them, technology, fuel consumption. We run a Crone Big X Harvester. Uh, had good success with that as far as chop quality and all the rest of it. Uh, a couple years ago, we purchased a Denmark made manure tanker, which allows us to inject manure in the summertime when we don't get the amount of rain. Uh, we also have a dribble flower, which you can see in the background just to lay it on the ground. Uh, environmental rules are not such that we have to, but we've definitely seen a marked improvement in our tonnage per se and quality, just getting manure on in a timely fashion. And we've actually reduced our purchase nitrogen just because we've seen the results of getting the manure on in the right way, especially in the summertime injecting. Um, yes, we have irrigation on some of it, not on all of it. But if you can get that manure ejected into the ground, you don't need the rain per se to wash it through. And it's, it's mind boggling what it does do for you and for your dirt especially. Um, is it for everybody? It's expensive and it is time consuming, that's for sure. But we've seen the benefits. Thanks a lot for the farm tour. Anytime.